Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all? This is the video lecture for PowerPoint slide lecture eight. And in this lecture, we're going to cover some macro topics. Topics will include the GDP. Then we're going to include circular flow of income with leakage. We're going to look at business cycles. We're going to look at GDP deflators, unemployment, and inflation. So there are a lot of topics to cover in this uh, lecture, but most of it are macro uh, topics. So national income accounting, basically, it is a me method by which we keep record of the national income, the, in the total income of the economy in a year. Okay, so the formal definition is it is a book, book, bookkeeping system that the government uses to measure the level of the country's economic activities at a particular point of time. So the accounting system used by the government to calculate how much income uh, the economy, the U.S. economy has made in the year 2022. That would be an example that would be national income accounting. So what it is used for? National income accounting is specifically needed. This, this data is needed by the government to measure and describe the different types of economic activity going on in the U.S. economy. So when they calculate the income and if they see most of the income is coming from manufacturing industry versus distribution, they can say the U.S. economy is more dependent on manufacturing industry versus the distribution industry. Or if the service industry is more dominant than the others, then we can say the U.S. economy is mostly service-based. Okay, So that's one thing we can figure out from this information. The second, secondly, it is also used to compare against your past performances. So we can use this 2022 data and compare it with the years 2020, 2021, 2019, and see where the economy has gone. Did it make improvements or did it make, you know, or was, were there, um, you know, decrease in the numbers? So, and what, are there any areas of improvement that the government can undertake to improve the numbers further? Okay, so that's another reason why we look into it. Thirdly, we compare it with other countries as well. Like, you know, the income numbers of, of the U.S. is of a year is compared to, let's say, Canada, England, Europe as a whole. And we want to see where we are at. Um, are we further ahead of them? Are we behind them? If we are behind them, what we can do to reach their level? And finally, the income number gives the government additional information of what type of economic policies can be undertaken. If the economy is lagging behind whether they should implement monetary or fiscal policy or whether they should cut down taxes or increase taxes. So all these policies, whether they will implement or not, depends partially on this data uh, being available to the government or calculated by the government. So there are several met metrics or there are several ways for calculating national income accounting. There are several different ways we can calculate the total income of the U.S. economy in a particular year. Some of these are GDP, GNP, and GNI. Okay, gross national product, gross national income, and gross domestic product. But in this lecture, we are going to focus specifically on GDP, which is the most common method used to calculate national income, not only in the U.S., but all over the world. Okay, It is the largest aggregate measure of economic activity. And what it measures is basically it measures the total final value of all final goods and services produced in the economy within a year. Notice the term final, right? So any type of intermediate goods or raw material goods will not be included in the calculation of GDP. Only final goods and services that are sold in the market are included in the GDP calculation. GDP usually includes the monetary value that is generated during the sales transaction for an end user and not at any other point. Okay, so whenever the final transaction takes place between the consumer and the seller, that is what is calculated or that is what is categorized under GDP, whether it is uh, services, whether it's durable goods or whether it's non-durable goods. So there are certain rules in GDP, okay? 
So GDP is basically me measured by summing the value added at each stage of production. Um, we're going to talk about that in a bit, but there are several transactions that are not specifically included in GDP, and we're going to look into that. Okay, so when we are calculating GDP, we do not include a lot of items in GDP. First of all, it includes the sale of all new goods and services in a year, but it does not include the sale of used products or products that are resold because these items have been sold once, have been accounted for, and if these products are resold, they are not accounted for um, in the GDP. Um, so, for instance, if you're selling your East used car to your friend, that will be not recorded under GDP. Goods that are produced outside the economy that are not in, are not included. So GDP means gross domestic product. Whatever is produced within the U.S. within the boundaries of the U.S. If the if if a U.S. company is producing goods in company, uh, uh, let's say if a U.S. company is producing goods in Canada, they have a factory in Canada and they're producing goods there that will not be included in the GDP because that factory is not within the map of the United States or not located domestically. So GDP does not take that into account. Now, of course, if there's trade involved, those will be in included. But if they are, pro if a U.S. company is producing goods in Canada and selling to the Canadian market, those goods will not be included in the U.S. GDP. Um, or if, you know, what is produced in the European continent to serve the European market that will not be included in the US GDP. Then the illegal sale of goods and services are not also taken into account because the government is not aware of these transactions. They, they do not keep any record of these transactions such as the black market and we don't, we don't know about these transactions so they are not recorded under the GDP. This is very important. Transfer payments made by the government are not included in GDP. Remember, transfer payments such as social security payments, unemployment benefits that the government pays out to people, these will not count towards GDP. So we take those out. Okay, so we, we will not use that information in calculating GDP. Intermediate goods such as raw materials that are used to produce other goods and services are not included in GDP. Then stocks sold for ownership exchange are also not included. So assume you own 50% stock of a company and you sell the 50% of the stock of the company in the stock market, then that sales transaction will not be included in the GDP. Okay, whether it's 50% or 10%, whatever sell you do, the any type of stock sale will not be included in the GDP. It also does not count any non-production transactions, only accounts for production transaction, but non-production transactions such as, you know, gift, private gift or a government gift, these will not be included in the GDP. Okay. However, if any commission is paid for the sale of good or financial transaction to a broker, that will be counted towards GDP. So it's very important to understand what is included and what is not included when we are calculating GDP. Even GDP can be calculated in using different methods. The value added method, which we saw here, that's, you know, the value is added at each production stages, the income approach and the expenditure approach. So there are three different ways we can calculate GDP, but for this class, you only need to know the expenditure approach. You don't have to know how to calculate GDP using value-added approach, or you don't need to know how to calculate GDP using income approach. So you forget about those two approaches for now and focus on the exp expenditure approach right now. So under the expenditure approach, there are four sectors that we look into uh, in order to calculate GDP. One is the consumers, you know, the buyers who buy goods, services, and um, uh, non-durable goods. Investors or businesses, we also look into the government, and we also look into the foreign market, exports and imports. Okay, so the formula to calculate GDP is given by C plus I plus G plus net exports. Okay, here C represents consumption. 
personal consumption, consumption of goods or services. All these are included under C. I represents your domestic investment by the businesses within the US. Okay. So if they are purchasing raw materials, if they are buying inventory, or if they are building a structure, or if they are building another office building for their business, all those will be classified under inventory. Government is G, or government expenditure is G. So any type of government expenditures will be included under G. And then XN is basically net exports, which is exports minus imports. Net exports is basically exports minus imports. To get into details, what C represents, C represents the spending by all individuals in the economy and households. So basically all the spending by the individuals and households in the economy on all final goods and services. When we say final goods and services, it includes the durable goods, non-durable goods and services. And usually when we calculate the GDP and we have these four sectors, consumption is the biggest sector out of all the four. Okay. Again, this is the, all the spending by individuals and households, not businesses, on durable, non-durable goods and services. One thing that is not included under consumption is when we purchase a new home. When we are purchasing a new home, it is more like an investment. It is not a consumption or spending. We, we buy that home and keep that home usually for a long period of time, usually 10, 12 or 15 years, right? So it is a investment and not a consumption. So we will not classify the purchase of a home under consumption. It will be classified under investment. But any type of other spending, if we are buying milk for the grocery, if we are buying gasoline from the grocery, if we are paying tuition, um, these are all expenditures and will be classified under consumption. Moving on, our next component on the GDP calculation is I, which represents gross private domestic investment. So this is basically all the different types of domestic investment by, made by the businesses within the US. Okay, now that means all type of spending by entrepreneurs and businesses to sustain and grow their business. It represents all business investments added to the in economy. Under I, it will include new capital goods and services in inventory as well as investment to replace equipment that has depreciated. So if they are buying new equipment for the business, if they are buying new inventory, if they are buying raw materials and mineral, or if they are replacing uh, existing equipment with a new one, then all these things are included under investments. Okay. Now also, if they are expanding a building or if they're buying a new office, to expand their operations, that is going to be an investment. So that will be included under investments. Okay. Remember purchase of new homes, that's an investment and not a consumption. So that will be classified under investment. One thing that is not included in investment and and in, and, and, I'll, and actually not included in GDP is purchase of stocks or purchase of securities. So if you're buying stocks or selling stocks of any company, these will not be included under investments or, or GDP. So the third category we move on to is called G. G basically represents government expenditure and government investments at all levels. When I say all levels, it includes federal, local, as well as state level. Okay. So if the government is um, doing new infrastructures, that will be included under G or um, uh, government expenditure. Other things included under G are salaries of government employee, employees, expenditure on training of government employees, then purchase of equipment that is to be used by government, then construction of highways, railroads, parks, etc. These are all categorized under G. So the next, the, the, the last sector to for the calculation of GDP is net exports. Net exports basically in, in includes exports and imports. And net exports is given by exports minus imports. Exports basically means when foreign countries such as Canada or England will buy goods produced within the US economy. Okay, so those are added in the GDP. So goods that are produced by US company or within the borders of the US uh, 
but they are purchased by Canada, Mexico or England or anywhere in the world, that is called exports and they will be calculated. On the other hand, we subtract imports from GDP because these are income going away from the US economy into foreign economies, right? Import basically means goods are produced outside of the US economy and our we are buying those goods from foreign countries. So we are paying our income out of the US economy to foreign countries and bringing in the goods to our own market. So income is going out, therefore we are subtracting imports from the total number. Net exports is basically the difference between the two. So let's do a quick example on how to calculate GDP. Um, we know that the formula of GDP is given by C plus I plus G plus net exports. But let's say we have data given to us right now. So this is the information that is given to us. Okay, We have durable goods. We have information about 2013 for US. And all these numbers are in millions. Uh, so let's say in 2013, people spent 1274 on the durable goods for non durable goods 2599. So these all these information are given to you. Now, what is the GDP of 2013? That is the question. So using the expenditure approach, using the table and use the expenditure approach to calculate the GDP of 2013. So the way we are going to do is first we are going to find out what is to be classified under consumption. So durable goods is a type of good spending by consumers, by um, households. So this will be classified under consumption. Then non-durable goods, that's also a spending by consumers, such as, you know, um, food, grocery, gas, that's non-durable goods. Durable goods are fridge, equipment, cars. So those go under consumption. Both of Durables and non durable go will go under consumption. Services are tuition, healthcare, child care services, auto care services. This is also goes under consumption. That's it. So that is all for C. For consumption, total number is 11373. Now we go to I, investments. Structures, these are buildings that are bought or built by uh, businesses, so we will include structures in there. Okay, then we have equipment, businesses buy equipment for their business, so that's also included under investments. Residential, when we are buying homes, purchasing new homes, that is not consumption, that is an investment, if you remember, so we will include that under I. And then finally, inventory. If businesses are buying inventory for their, um, you know, business, that is also investment. So we add that also. So total comes out to be 2151 when we add all these numbers. The next one is exports. So that should go under net exports, which is XN. So 2204. And we subtract the imports. Because net exports is basically exports minus imports, right? So 2204 minus 27, sorry, it should be 2747. Seven. 2747. Seven. So we get actually a negative number of minus 543 when we do the calculation. That means the U U.S. economy is importing more goods than exporting. That's why we have a negative number. And then finally, G, remember, it is the government expenditure at all levels. So federal government and state government both will be included under G, 1177 plus 1846. This number and this number. That is equivalent to 30. Two, three. Out of the four categories, look at this. Consumption is the biggest one. Consumption has the biggest category. But now we calculate the GDP. So the way to calculate GDP is C plus I plus G plus XN. So we add these, this plus, so 11373 plus this number. This is nothing. 2151. Plus government 3023. 
Now this is a negative number, so it's going to be in minus net exports. So the total GDP, if you add up or uh, you know do a net of these numbers, is sixteen thousand million in the year twenty thirteen. That is the GDP for the U.S. in twenty thirteen. So that is how we will calculate. We will have a table, and using this table, we will use the different numbers. To calculate the GDP. So hope that's helpful to you guys. Now what is macroequilibrium? Macroequilibrium in the economy occurs when the quantity of total spending on goods and services equals the total production of goods and services. So we achieve equilibrium when the demand or the total spending on goods and services is equal to the total supply of goods and services. So all the goods in the market are bought out by the people. There is no unexpected increase or decrease in inventory. There is no surplus of inventory or there is no shortage of inventory. So total spending by consumer is equal to total output brought by producers. When this happens, the economy is said to be at full employment, which means we are the businesses are hiring all the resources to produce the maximum output possible. So that is the maximum output possible uh, point. Okay. Now, macroequilibrium cannot occur at times when all the capacity to produce is not being used. So, if we are not using all the resources or capacity, then we cannot achieve macroequilibrium. Macro In this case, the factors of production such as labor and capital, they are not fully used and unemployed. And this is when the economy is underperforming because when we are not using all capital, all machines and all labor, we are not producing the maximum output available. Uh, you know, uh, or possible people don't have enough income also to because they don't have the jobs, so they cannot buy the goods in the market, and therefore the economy is underperforming. Macroequilibrium cannot also be achieved if total spending, if your spending by the consumer exceeds the total supply or output brought by the sellers. This will cause shortages, and the price of the goods and services will go up. It will create shortages both in the product and resource market. Okay, and eventually there will be inflation in the market and economy will get overheated. Like right now, what we are facing or what we faced last year, it's cooling down a little bit right now, but price of goods and services have gone up significantly because spending have gone up, but the supply was not enough. So as a result, prices of goods have gone up, which is basically inflation. The next topic we talk about are leakages and injections, okay? Remember the circular flow of income model. We will add additional uh, additional items to this model, okay? Remember, we only had the households and the businesses. Households owned the factors of production or resources, and they sold it um, as raw materials to the businesses, and businesses paid an income to the households. What the businesses did with the resources, they basically assembled them and produced final goods and services, brought them into the product market, and the households would again buy the final goods and services and pay a price which goes as revenue to the business. But now we are going to add the government and trade into this model, which are going to cause injections and leakages into this model. When I say injections, that means more income is coming into the system because of certain activities that's injection so within the within the circular flow of model more income is coming in that's injection leakages income is going out of the circular flow of model and that is why it is called leakages so there are three activities that cause leakages first of all when consumers pay income tax or other different types of taxes that income is going away out of the model to government so that's a leakage when there is import that income is also going to other countries and not in the U.S. economy. So the income is leaving the model. So that's the leakage. And if households are also or individuals are saving their money, that is also a leakage because they are taking the money out of the economy and not spending it. Now, what are injections? What are additional income coming into the economy? If the government spends money into the economy, if the government is giving subsidies or they are take up new um, projects, then the money or the income is coming into the economy and therefore there is more income. 
if banks lend out more savings funds and give loans to businesses. So there's, there's more additional income coming in, no more funds available, and so there will be more income. Finally, if there are more exports, so which means foreigners are countries, uh, foreigners are buying our produced goods, and as a result, income is coming back into our economy. So let's look at it in terms of the diagram, how it will look. So originally we know that's I feel so bad. So let's say we have two entities, right? This is household and this is business. Okay, so in the original circular flow of model, they sell resources, the land, labor, capital, and entrepreneur. In return, they get income, right? Rent, salary, interest, and profit. Then businesses sell final products or final goods and services. And they pay revenue to the, the households pay revenue to the business in the form of price. Okay, now what are some of injections? What are some of the injections income coming in? So these are injections items. One of them is export because income is coming in. Second one is government spending. When government spends money into the economy, there is more income in the economy. They hire, they're hiring people and people have more income and therefore income goes up. And also, if there is loans for investments by the banks. So these are injection items. Now, what about leakages? On the other hand, we have leakages. Leakages are income. Leakages are income going out of the economy. So these are going out. So if you see here, these ones are coming in into the model. This is the circular flow of income. And leakages are activities that cause income to out of the economy. So what are those? One is saving. Two is taxes paid by some illegal income and number three is illegal. So that helps you to give you an understanding how we can add these different entities to the circular flow of model and then how it impacts the circular flow of model. Okay. So the economy will be in equilibrium if your savings plus tax plus imports is equal to your investment plus government expenditure plus exports. If injections is equal to leakages, then the economy will be in equilibrium. An imbalance can happen when leakages are greater than injections or injections are greater than, uh, uh, you know, leakages. If leakages are greater than injection, then there is a decrease in spending. We are taking out more money from the economy, so people are spending less in the economy, so spending will go down, and it can eventually lead to a recession. On the other hand, if injections are greater than leakages, then the increase there will be an increase in total spending, so spending will go up, and we are going to have an overheated economy with inflation. So each leakage should be paired with an injection. Tax should match with government spending. Savings should match with business investments. Exports should match with imports. So each of the injection items are matched with each of the leakage items. So how do recessions begin? Like how do we know, like how do we have more leakages versus less injections? So well, how the starting of the recession happens when there is a decrease in spending and inventory level start growing up. So that is a good signal of 
how, where the economy is headed towards. So if inventory levels in the market are going up, that means we are headed towards recession um, and the macroeconomic equilibrium will not be reached. So it starts off when there is a decrease in spending. When you decrease less spending, people are going to buy less in the market. So inventory already in the market will build up. The supply, they're not being used up. So the inventory will build up. Right, the increase in inventory is not planned. People, the suppliers or the businesses did not expect this, so this is an unplanned investment. So when retailers see that their inventory levels have gone up, they cut down their orders from distributors as well as lay off their salespeople. So that's the first step of recession. They are cutting down or they are canceling their distribution orders that's going to cut down because they already have a lot of inventory in the market and they're also laying off people to cut down cost and they, they don't need salespeople because people are not buying. So when the distributor gets notified that they don't need, that their order is cancelled, they will cancel their order with the manufacturers. So factories will cut down their production and lay off factory workers. So there will be more layoffs. As a result, when salespeople in the retailer and then when uh, distributor people working in the distributors and factory workers working in the manufacturers, they get laid off. They have less income now. They don't have any income, right? Because their source of income has gone down. So spending decreases further and this cycle continues, this reci recession cycle continues. So during recession, business also make less investments in the economy. So the GDP drops. So some of the characteristics of recession includes decreased spending, um, then businesses cut down production, higher unemployment, inflation is lower, then less people uh, will pay less taxes because they don't have any income, so less tax collection, and more government spending because government has to pay unemployment benefits and welfare. Also, we will see some bankruptcies by companies as well as personal individuals during recessions. So using the leakage and injection model, Recession happens when there is a decrease in injection or increase in leakages. We usually have recession when we have the following scenarios. When savings are greater than investments, when taxes are greater than government spending, or when imports are greater than exports. The third one is a rare case, but most of the time it's the first two cases when we are going to see a recession. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is business cycles. Okay, so business cycles um, basically represents the fluctuations or the changes in your real GDP or economic activities of, of a particular economy in the short run. So basically, business cycle means how the GDP changes, increase, decrease, increase, decrease over a period of time or how the economic activities of an economy changes over a period of time. Macroeconomic instability describes the irregular, unexpected changes in business activity. Now, business cycle, business cycle consists of periods of recessions and unemployment, which is followed by inflation and an overheated economy. So basically, in a business cycle, uh, when the economy is doing well, we are going to see it moving. It's moving towards an overheated economy, and usually, overheated economy is associated with inflation. In a business cycle, we will also see that over a period of time, the economy reaches a peak and then it starts declining, or the economy activity starts going down, and it goes through a recession. Um, and unemployment is associated with recession. So when recession happens, um, you know, demand falls. Uh, inventory builds up, lays off, ha lay layoffs happen, and therefore unemployment goes up. So we are going to do a graph to explain how the business cycle looks like. Okay, so this is the general model of a business cycle. Okay, so on the x-axis we have year one, two, three. So let's say year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year year six, and then on this side we have real GDP. Okay, on the y-axis, we have real GDP. So the business cycle is basically up and down curve that goes up and down. Okay, now we have to understand the different parts in the business cycle. Um, so for instance, the, the peaks or the top of the curves, the points of the top of the curves, these are called peak. 
okay? And I'm going to explain what peak means. The bottom of the curves, these, are called troughs, okay? The downward, the downward sloping part of the curve, like these downward sloping curve, these represents recession. This is when the economy is declining and the economy is going through a recession. So economy and the upward sloping point is basically represents economic growth. So look at the business cycle. What it happens is the economy goes up, it reaches the highest point, and after that it starts declining and goes through a recession reaches a lowest point, and then after that, the economy starts rebuilding again and then recovers from the recession. Then it starts growing, experiencing economic growth, again reaches the tip, and after that starts declining again to go through a recession. And this cycle follows on again and again. So this is called a business cycle. But if you look at it, the overall upward, the overall trend is upward. So even though the GDP is going up and down, up and down, up and down, but the overall GDP over the years in the long term is going up for a country. That is usually the trend in the USA. Okay, now what does this peak mean? The peak basically means your highest economic activity in that business cycle. So a business cycle starts from here, from one, to, uh, from one lowest point, Let's say one lowest point to one lowest point. That is one business cycle. Then this to this is another business cycle. This to this is another business cycle. So from the lowest, from one lowest point to another lowest point is a business cycle, or from one highest point to another highest point is a business cycle. And then the peak in the business cycle is basically your highest economic activity, and trough is basically lowest economic activity. Okay, so we need to be able to explain or draw this graph and then explain the different points. We need to understand what peak means, which means highest economic activity. We need to understand what trough means, which is lowest economic activity. We need to understand what is where, where is economic recession happening, where is economic growth happening, and we should be able to explain what is the overall trend of the GDP over the long run. So that is the graph for business cycle. And this slide basically explains the different points on the cycle. So just like, um, as I mentioned, peak, peak is basically maximum point of economic activity in a cycle, or it's the highest economic activity in a cycle. Trough, which is the lowest points, re reflects the lowest point of business activity in a cycle. A recovery period of renewed economic activity between trough and peak. So that is known as the economic growth. And recession is the period of decreasing economic growth between peak and trough. So this is the period of recession. This is the period of recovery and economic growth. So now you understand what this graph means and how the GDP fluctuates in the short run and in the long run. So that helps us to understand the business cycles. Then we move on to talk about nominal GDP versus real GDP. This is very important. We talked what GDP is, we saw how to calculate GDP, then we saw through the business cycles how the GDP fluctuates over time, but we need to understand the difference between nominal GDP and real GDP. So nominal GDP is basically your raw calculation of GDP, okay? It is what we get when we add up all the numbers valuing each pur purchase in current year dollars. Okay, so it is the it, when we add up all the purchases and then come uh, and then you get the summation result, that is the nominal GDP. It is a raw number because this number has not been adjusted for inflation because prices have changed over the years for these goods and services, so we have to take that into consideration. But nominal GDP does not take inflation into account, and the number that we get from the calculation of nominal GDP is not inflation adjusted. So the result that we will compare it with previous years or with other countries is not going to be true or is not going to 
give us the proper or information because it will be overinflated most of the time because it has not been adjusted for inflation as prices go up over the years. Hence, we have to convert nominal GDP to real GDP. Real GDP is basically your nominal GDP that has been adjusted with inflation or adjusted for inflation. This is a more realistic number and this number should be used for comparisons purposes with previous years as well as with other countries. So the way we what we know how to calculate nominal GDP. Nominal GDP is basically consumption plus investment plus government expenditure plus net exports. From previous slides we know that. Now to compute real GDP we basically take nominal GDP and then we divide it by a price index called GDP deflator and then multiply it by 100, okay? Now, we all will also show how we calculate a GDP deflator. A GDP deflator is basically a price index which accounts for the inflation, which basically is a measure for the inflation. And the way we calculate GDP defl deflator is equals to the sample price in the current year, then we divide it by the sample price in the base year, times 100. Now what's base here? Base here is basically a year that we consider as the starting point. So this is something we will determine what a base year is or you will be given with the information which one is your base year. So first you have to, the, step, the way to calculate real GDP is step one, you have to calculate GDP deflator which is the price in the current year divided by price in the base year times 100. Once you find out the GDP deflator, then you calculate real GDP using the formula nominal GDP divided by GDP deflator times 100. Okay. Again, base year is arbitrarily chosen and it is something you will choose or the government will choose. In a problem set, the base year will be given to you. So you don't have to select arbitrarily, but th that base year will be usually given to you and you can use that information for calculation purposes. Another thing to remember, this is very important, in a base year, the GDP deflator is always equals to 100. This is because the price in the base year and the current year will be the same for the base year, right? So that's why the GDP deflator in the base year will always be 100. Now I want to do an example so we understand how to calculate real GDP and how to calculate GDP deflator given we have some information, okay? So let's start, look at that. Here is the example. I'll start with this. Let's say the price of the current year of 2021. So we are considering current year is 2021 and the price for a particular good in the current year is $306. And the price of the same good in the base year, it's given, is $300. So given this information, what is the GDP deflator? Remember, GDP deflator is basically price in given year or current year divided by price in base year times 100. So what is your par price in current year? Current year is 2021, which is 306. So we take 306, divide that by the base year, a price of the base year is the $300, then multiply that by 100, we get 102. That is our GDP deflator. That is the first step we have done, okay? So that is how we will calculate GDP deflator. Now, next question we have, in 2021, we calculate that the nominal GDP of the country or the U.S. economy is $1,250 billion. So we now know it's, it's for the same, it's the same problem. So we now know the nominal GDP. We know the GDP deflator. We are asked to calculate what is the real GDP. So real GDP will be equals to your nominal GDP, which is $1,250 billion divided by your GDP deflator, 102 times 100, that is equals to 1, 2, 2, 5 billion. So see, this number is more realistic when you are making comparisons to other years or uh, or to the GDP of other countries. If you were using this raw number or the nominal GDP, 1250, 
This is overestimated, right? Because it has not accounted for the inflation or the change in price over the period of time for this good because the price has gone up from 300 to 306. So that's why we have to adjust the nominal GDP to real GDP. So this is the number that we were going to use to compare it with other years. Okay, so 1225 billion is your real GDP. That is the way you will calculate real GDP. Okay, we also look into economic growth and stagnation. So to measure the growth or stagnation or decline. So again, you will have to see if the economy has grown over the years or if the economy has shrunk or if the economy has remained stagnant over the years. Okay, so the way to calculate it is basically we do a person change. Okay, so we do a person change over, over the two years and see where we are at. So again, look at, looking at an example of this side okay on 2004 the real gdp is 1089.3 million and in 2005 the real gdp is 11175.6 million we want to know if the real gdp by how much the real gdp has grown or shrunk over the years so the way to do it is we do person change again look going back to the formula the change divide times 100 divided by the original number so change is 11175.6 million minus 10849.3 divided by the original number. Original number is this one, which is the number that we start off with 10849.3, and then we multiply by 100. Okay, so the answer that we get is 3.01 percent growth so from 2004 to 2005 this economy has grown by 3.01 percent so that is the growth okay from 2004 to 2005 real gdp has increased from 10,839 million to 11,175 million basically this reflects a 3.101 percent growth over one year so economic growth is defined as an increase in real GDP as it is measured as a percentage change. If the growth rate is 3% or more, then we are experiencing economic growth. So in this case, it is more than 3%. So we are experiencing economic growth from 2004 to 2005. Now, of course, if it was a negative number, then it, then it would have been that the economy has declined or gone into a recession. But if the growth rate is between 0 to 2 percent then it is called a stagnant economy so basically a stagnant economy is one where there not much growth has taken place and the growth rate is actually less than three percent okay so just remember when we are more three percent or more that's economic growth less than three percent is based or zero between zero to three percent is stagnant economy and if it's a negative number then that's basically the gdp is decreasing or the economy is shrinking okay so then we move on to the next topic which is called inflation we said the gdp has to be so we said the gdp has to be adjusted for inflation so we convert nominal GDP um, to real GDP so we can get inflation adjusted GDP. What, but what does this inflation mean? Inflation is basically the increase in the price of goods and services over time. So let's say three years back, you bought a bottle of milk for $1, but now the bottle of milk as of today in 2023, it costs you $1.75. So the price of the, this bottle of milk has gone up over these three years, and this is known as inflation. Okay, so over time, you have to spend more to fill up your gas tank or to buy a gallon of milk or to get a haircut. These are all examples of inflation. Inflation reduces the purchasing power of consumers, right? For instance, your income is fixed but the price of goods and services are going up. So your affordability and your um, uh, purchasing power is going down as prices are going up, unless you get an increase in salary. 
The consumer price index is a measure that we use to calculate inflation. It basically looks at the average change over time in prices paid by consumers for a basket of consumer goods and services. Now, this is a very complicated process. I just want you to know that consumer price index or CPI is one way we calculate inflation in uh, the economy. If you take a macro class, we are going to look into how we are going to calculate the CPI. But for this class, you just need to know that in order to calculate inflation, CPI is the most popular method we use, where we take a basket of consumer goods and services and then compare the price of this basket of goods and services over different periods of time to see how the price has increased. Okay, so that's very important. What are some of the disadvantages of inflation? So inflation in general is not a good thing for consumers, right? Because they have to pay higher prices. On the other hand, for the producers, it is a good thing because they can earn higher money by selling the goods and services. So what are some of the disadvantages of inflation? First of all, the purchasing power of your income or the dollar overall falls. Money income is the actual amount of money one has. Real income is what goods and services one can purchase with their money income. So when average price rise, but your real income remains the same, so your purchasing power or affordability will go down. So that's one of the disadvantage. Second, income is redistributed. So if the price of goods and services that you consume increase, but if the price of goods and services that your neighbor normally consumes are not rising, then your money income declines in value compared to your neighbor's income, right? So income will be redistributed. So let's say he's he, he, my neighbor shops in Walmart, but the price of goods in the Walmart store has not gone up over the years. But I shop in Tom Tom, but the price of goods and services in Tom Tom has gone up over the years. So if you, in that case, his income has still the same purchasing power, but my income now has lower purchasing power. So this is going to cause some redistribution of income. Services such as healthcare experience experience much faster price increases than goods. Senior citizens have fixed income and consume a lot of healthcare services. So when the price of healthcare goes up, it is very difficult for them to afford healthcare versus younger people whose income is more, um, you know, who have rising income and their salaries are going up. So that's another disadvantage. The third disadvantage is wealth is redistributed also. So during inflation, some asset values will rise faster while other asset values will not rise. For instance, during inflation, we'll see real estate and other hard assets. The value of the real estate or your home will go up very significantly, but the other assets such as your savings accounts or CD account or a bond does not increase in value as much as the real estate. So it's going to cause a redistribution in wealth because let's say you have a CD account of 50,000 and you also own a home, but the value of the home will go up at a greater percentage and the value of the city will not go up at, by as much. So you will probably spend more money towards the home because now wealth is more valuable than that city. So there will be redistribution of some wealth. It also causes reduced savings rate because during inflation, prices are high. So people try to buy things before the prices will go up further. So spending, they will spend more um, than they would during price stability. If savings are put into fixed savings accounts, then the money comes out and has less purchasing power. So they don't tend to, people don't tend to put the money in the savings account because the savings rate is paying them low rate. Fifth disadvantage of inflation is business plans are disrupted because inflation makes it difficult to forecast future revenues and costs for businesses it becomes difficult for owners to know what will be the impact of inflation on future goods and services and resource costs. So they become very careful in what type of capital they want to invest, right? So they are reluctant to make these investments and as a result that affects the overall economy. Finally, the, another disadvantage is basically your interest rate increase. There will be rise in the interest rate uh, that we are on on the that we have to pay on the loans 
because your inflation is going up, right? So nominal, the way the interest rates are priced is nominal interest rate. The rate that we see for a loan is actually equals to real interest rate plus the bank accounts for the inflation, right? So if your home loan has an interest rate of 5%, that is actually nominal interest rate out of which 3% is probably real interest rate, that is the earning of the banks, and 2% is the inflation that they have already accounted for in the calculation. So you will see when inflation happens, this nominal interest rate will go up because the inflation section or portion of the interest rate is going up. There are three different types of inflation that we need to know. Monetary inflation, demand pool inflation, and cost pool inflation. So what is monetary inflation? So when the supply of money in the economy grows, there is more money available for the people. So they spend more um, and credit is easier to obtain because the supply of money is more. So people can get more loans more easily. People have more supply of money. So they spend more money. And as a result, the price of goods and services goes up. Okay. The Fed basically controls the money supply. So if they are increasing the money supply, uh, too much, there will be in too much inflation caused by monetary inflation. The second type of inflation is called demand pool inflation. This theory says that inflation is caused by too much demand um, uh, by people or because they have too much money, but there are too few goods or too less supply of goods in the economy. So when there is a shortage of goods in the market, but consumers and buyers are demanding a lot of that, then the price will go up and that is known as demand pull inflation. For instance, let me give you a very good example. During COVID, everyone was looking for toilet papers, right? So the demand for toilet papers went up significantly, but that there was not enough toilet papers in the market. So the price of the toilet papers also went up. This is known as demand pull inflation, that there's too much money in the economy, for which there's too much demand, but unfortunately there's too less supply to meet the demand. So the way to adjust is the suppliers increase the price so they can make more money at that time. So when the growth of money is faster than the growth of goods and services, sellers are faced with more pressure to sell more. So they, they become less efficient and ultimately their costs rise and the, they rise uh, and they increase their prices. The third type of inflation is known as cost push inflation. This is um, inflation caused because businesses experience an increase in cost of their of the resources like land, labor, capital, or entrepreneurs. If the cost of these resources go up, then they experience high costs. So in return, they increase the price of the goods and services because they have to cover these costs to make money. And that is known as cost push inflation. Okay, so in this case, the owners of the factors of production resources increase their price, for which you know ultimately the resource cost goes up. So only way they can sell and make money is they have to increase the prices in the economy. The main reason for cost push inflation are increasing price resources, or if um, uh, labor are asking for higher wages, or if there is one supplier that is only supplying. Uh, you know, one resource and there's monopoly power. So the businesses don't have any other options. So they have to buy their supply from this one vendor. So if they increase the price, they have to buy it because there is demand for the good. So in return, their cost goes up and they will increase the price of their goods and services. So we talked about inflation. Now we're going to talk about the last topic of this lecture, which is unemployment. That is another big macro topic that we have to discuss um, and look into. Okay. Unemployment is basically you will, the economy will experience unemployment when the economy is going through a recession or when, the, when there is a slowing business cycle. Again, if we look at the, if we remember the business cycle going up and down, up and down, the downward portion of the curve reflects recession or slowing business cycle. And that is where we will, ex the economy will experience a lot of unemployment. So what does unemployment mean? Unemployment is defined as the workers who are willing and able to work for pay, but are, are unable to find work. 
So look at the definition. It is very important. The workers must be willing and able to work. Now, if they're willing, but they don't have the ability to work, they are not considered unemployment are unemployed. If they are able but they are not willing, they are not considered unemployed. For instance, let's assume as I did my master's and I in electrical engineering and I have the qualifications to start off as an engineer um, in a big company but I decide to be a house husband and not work. So I have the ability to work but I'm not willing. In that case, I will not be considered unemployed. I must be willing and able to do the job and but unfortunately I, I cannot find a job for a period of time such as a month then I am classified as an unemployed worker or labor okay so the way you calculate unemployed rate is the number of unemployed divided by the total labor force now total labor force includes everyone employed plus unemployed but it does not include people who are out of the labor force such as housewives, house husbands or people who are retired or minor minorities. They are not part of the labor force. People who are currently employed and people who are unemployed are known as uh, are part of the labor force. But other people are not like house has housewife, house husband, retired personal, um, prisoners, people in the hospital, they are not part of the labor force. So the next slide talks about just that Basically, the total labor force includes those willing and able to work, whether employed or unemployed. Okay, so both the criteria has to meet willing and able. As long as they're willing and able to work and they're employed or unemployed, then they're part of the labor force. So I want to do an example on how to calculate the unemployment rate. Just for simplicity purposes, look at the left side, right side of the screen, which says unemployment rate. So let's say currently Plano's labor force is 400,000. This is just a, you know, just a example. It's not the, the like correct numbers. We're just assuming. Okay. So this 400,000 includes both unemployed and unemployed people in the labor force. It does not include retired people or it does not include housewives or prisoners or other people, but just people who are willing and able to work, but employed and unemployed. So that's. 400,000. And out of that 400,000, we have 10,000 people who are unemployed in Plano. Okay. So what is the current unemployment rate in Plano? The way we do is unemployment rate is given by unemployed workers divided by total labor force times 100. So here is unemployment, unemployed workers are 10,000 workers, total labor force is 400,000. So we multiply by that by 100. So 2.5%. So the unemployment rate in Plano is only 2.5%, which is not bad. It is a good thing. Okay, so that is how we are going to calculate unemployment rate. Going back, there are four different types of unemployment uh, that we're going to talk about. Seasonal unemployment, cyclical unemployment, frictional unemployment, and structural unemployment. Seasonal unemployment, let's start with that. It's not a serious type of unemployment. So in general, unemployment is a bad thing, right? When the economy is going through a recession, economic activities are falling, people are losing jobs, they can't find jobs, that's when unemployment rate goes up. So in reality, we don't want a lot of unemployment in the economy, right? So it's a bad thing. So, but in general, seasonal unemployment is not that bad. Basically, these are workers or people whose work depends on the season of the year. Like, you know, someone um who is basically a lifeguard they'll they're probably working um in the beaches or in the swimming pools during the summer during the winter beaches are closed or the pools are closed nobody are using them so we, we don't need the lifeguards during that period of time or let's say department store santas during thanksgiving and christmas stores hire these people to dress up as santas so they can sell more products um but that's seasonal. They only hire them during November, December, and January. After that, they, do, they don't need those people because that season has gone. So 
that the skills of that worker is no longer needed. So this type of unemployment is seasonal. When they have employment, that they are employed, but when they lose their job because the season is gone, that is known as seasonal unemployment. Okay, but it is not much of a problem. The second type of unemployment is called cyclical unemployment. This occurs when there is insufficient demand for labor in the economy due to declining business cycle or recession. Again, remember the business cycle when the economy is going down, basically economic activities are falling. So now people are laying off, people have less income, they're gonna have less demand in the market for goods and services. And as a result, what are the pro suppliers or businesses gonna do? They have to cut down their production and they have to reduce their costs. One way they reduce their costs is by laying off people so they have less demand for labor. So when the economy is going through a recession, businesses demand less workers and as a result, people lose their job and that type of unemployment is called cyclical unemployment. Third one is called frictional unemployment. This occurs when workers are moving between jobs. So let's say I am um, calling, I'm working as a adjunct professor at Colin College. Now I don't like this job anymore. I give it up and then I take two months to find another administrative assistant job. That period of two months of unemployment is known as frictional unemployment. Okay. So it is basically the period of temporary unemployment or the period of adjustment while one worker is looking for a job or moving to a new job. So again, it can be by choice or it can be due to cyclical unemployment. But again, this is not a problem because it's a temporary period of time. Finally, we have structural unemployment. So structural unemployment, it is the most difficult type of unemployment and worst type of unemployment that an economy can face. It occurs when basically businesses demand for labor but the labor do not have the skills or knowledge to perform those jobs. So the businesses will not hire those labor because they don't have the skills, okay? So if workers do not keep up with the job demand or they lack basic knowledge, then even if the job market is expanding, the business are not gonna hire these people because it's, it's worthless, they don't have the skills. They're not gonna spend money and invest on them and train them. They want already skilled workers so they can bring them in and start the production right away, correct? Uh, for instance, in the US, if you cannot speak in English, then you will not be hired in most of the jobs. Yes, you will find some jobs, but there, most of the jobs require you to speak in English. But if you lack that basic knowledge, then you will not be hired. And that is known as structural unemployment. This is a very difficult and costly program. Government usually creates training programs for people to help grow their skills um, and get those uh, you know basic knowledge so they become trained and ready for the job market. But again, this is a very difficult type of unemployment. The last thing that we're going to talk about is the full employment. Remember, we discussed this also in the beginning of the class. Full employment is when the economy is utilizing or using all the resources in the economy, land, labor, capital, fully to produce the maximum output. But even at that point, when the economy is operating at its full scale, there will be some level of unemployment. We cannot have 0% unemployment rate. There will be still some unemployed people because of frictional unemployment and because of lack of skills. But the unemployment rate that exists when the economy is at full employment, that unemployment rate is known as the natural rate of unemployment. Okay, so that's the definition is the unemployment rate that exists at full employment no, is known as natural rate of unemployment. Current goal 3% is the natural rate of unemployment. So we want to be as close to as 3%, then we can say the economy is at full employment. Okay, because we assume at this rate, the production will be maximum or the output will be maximum in the society. Now, over the years, the natural rate of unemployment can have varied and changes. Like in the 1980s, it was 6%, but now it's 3% because there are more job opportunities. People have more skills, job markets have expanded, you know, so, so many things have happened. New type of jobs have come up. So that's why this natural rate of unemployment has gone down over the years.
So that's the end of this lecture. We have covered GDP, we have covered inflation, we have covered growth, business cycles, and we also talked about unemployment. Remember one thing, when the economy is growing and overheated, then we experience inflation. And when the economy is experiencing a decline or recession, that is when we experience unemployment. Okay, so these are the two major variables to look into in when government is trying to come up with a policy and help the economy grow or stop an inf or recession. Okay, so keep that in mind. So we're going to stop here. Next class, we're going to continue with lecture nine. Thank you very much.